Richard Widmark, Joan Caulfield, James A. Farley. Star on Family Theater. The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Stolen Symphony, starring Richard Widmark and Joan Caulfield. Brief portions are transcribed. James A. Farley is your host. We are hopeful that international conferences may prevent future wars. We give generously to help those who are suffering, especially the little children who are born into a world at war and who are still suffering from its terrible after effects. As a nation, as individuals, we want peace. But without God, there can be no peace. All history teaches that, because without faith, there can be no freedom. And when freedom dies, a new war is born. Our homes, our communities, our nation, and the world would be renewed with a peaceful, generous, God-loving spirit if we as individuals made God a part of our homes, if we made family prayer a daily practice in our homes. For this is so very true. A family at prayer is a family at peace, and the world at prayer means the world at peace. James A. Farley returns following our family theater story, Stolen Symphony, starring Joan Caulfield and Richard Widmark. Tonight, Family Theater brings you a half hour of music and melody. So just relax, folks. Close your eyes and dream with us. Maybe we can brush the dust of a tired day out of your mind with a little soothing symphony. Friends, I'm sorry to break into the music like this and cross up the airwaves, but it's the only chance I'll have to tell you what happened. I won't disturb the music very much, so here's the way it was. This morning at dawn, I was over the Rocky Mountains, flying eastward into the sunrise. Far below me, the tracks of the Santa Fe ran like a silver ribbon into infinity. It was just a routine test flight of the new XP-88. Everything was going along smoothly when, just like that... Something in the motor burst. It gave no warning, just exploded into a shower of oil and flames. There were two or three terrifying seconds before I realized what had happened and could move into action. The plane was ablaze when I opened the escape hatch and jumped. A brief singeing flame licked at my hair as I yanked the ripcord. Then I felt the jerk and the momentary pause as the chute opened. And then I lost consciousness. I landed lightly on my feet. It was strange, because I was filled with a sudden surge of joy, an exhilaration and love of living. It was wonderful just to stand there and look at the mountains in the distance and the trees nearby. And then I saw my parachute being blown across the clearing. That surprised me, because I didn't remember releasing the straps. And then... Then I saw the body still in the harness, being dragged along the ground after the chute. Panic-stricken, I ran after it, and I tried to stop it by catching the shrouds, but my hands passed through the cords and left them untouched. The chute kept billowing in the wind and dragging after it was the body. Finally, the silk caught in the trees at the edge of the clearing, and it stopped. Then I saw the face clearly. It was my own. I'd really known it from the moment I saw the body. Some of the clothes were burned, but the face was almost untouched. It was strange as I waited and looked. 
I felt that I was waiting for some decision to be made, some judgment that would sum up my life. But there was no court, no witness, no testimony, not even a judge. I stood there alone in the clearing, bending over the partly burned body and looking into my own face. Everything that I'd ever done was carved into the lines of it. And then I knew. This was the judgment, the decision. I was judge and witness and accused. I saw all the evidence and read the verdict in my own face. The face hadn't changed. It looked exactly as it did when I was alive. Every line in it I'd put there myself, hour by hour, by thoughts and deeds through the long years. Only now, I knew what the lines meant. It was like looking into a mirror and knowing what kind of a guy I really was. Not someone to be damned, I knew that. But I didn't think I wanted to go to heaven looking that way either. And then suddenly... Beside me stood a beautiful young lady. She was dressed in blue denim trousers and a plaid shirt. Her hair was tousled and she smiled gravely when she spoke. How are you, Jerry? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm all right, I guess. Congratulations. Congratulations? For what? Well, we've done a pretty good job. We? Well, yes, we. Well, I, I've never seen you before. Oh, I've been around with you 24 hours a day for 23 years. I'm an angel. You're an angel? Mm-hmm. You're an angel. Well, uh, do all angels have red hair? Oh, uh, only some of us. The seraphim are mostly blonde when they appear. Uh-huh. Well, don't you like red hair? I'll change it. Well, you mean that you... Hey, it's black. <laughs> yes. Better this way? No, no, no. Uh, better red. I like red myself. You uh, can change it to any color, huh? Don't mind appearances, Jerry. Colors and shapes and distances are only accidents. Yeah, I know, but uh, you look just like an ordinary girl. Certainly. Angels can change into any form they wish. Just name it. Oh, no, no, that's all right. You're, uh, you're just fine the way you are. <laughs> Thank you. Say, uh, does the Lord stand for that? Angels turning into, uh, into flaming redheads? <laughs> Jerry, you don't know him very well. That's why the world's so full of variety. He loves it. Well, I've been living close to him for, uh, well, almost a million years. And then working with the Guardian since the world began. And I can never tell what he'll do next. A million years? Oh, oh not measuring by the sun, of course. Uh. You're not in time anymore, Jerry. We're living in eternity. No time, changing colors, no distance. That's right. Well, Jerry, you and I better get going. Oh, oh wait, uh, there, there's just one thing. Yes? Could I, uh, well, uh, I, I'd just like to see how my mother's taking what happened. You'd like to see her? Yeah, could we? We certainly can. Just put your hand on my arm. Uh, like that? Yes. And just like that, we were home. We walked right through the doors without opening them and right into the kitchen where Mother was frying bacon and eggs for breakfast. Mother moved happily from stove to table and back again. She didn't seem at all worried, so I knew that she hadn't heard yet about my crash. She was humming as she walked right through the angel and toward the kitchen door. Oh, Billy! Alice, breakfast is ready. You'll have to hurry. Coming, Mother. Okay, Mom. Oh, oh, Mr. Adams, you frightened me. Good morning. Morning. Some extra bread today? Yes, two loaves, please. Thank you. Won't you have a cup of coffee? No, thanks. I got to get along. Beautiful morning. Look at the way the sun comes through them trees. Just like you see it in the moving pictures. Oh, it's a beautiful and clear blue sky. That means good flying weather. Oh, you mean for Jerry? Mm-hmm. He'll be home tonight. What's he up to now? Oh, he's bringing some kind of a test plane in from the coast. He is? Mm-hmm. Well, Margaret Winters... If that boy knowed how much you loved him, he wouldn't be doing a dangerous job like that. He's a good boy, Mr. Adams. Yes, I know that, and but he has then... to take the best job he can find. You know, he's saving up for his wedding, and... Oh, I'd forgot about that. Yep, he's all grown up. Well, that's how it is. They're here with you today, then they grow up, and they're gone. Well, two loaves? Two will be fine. Bye. Goodbye, Mr. Adams. I saw new meaning for the simple things that were said and done. In life, it seemed I hadn't time to notice them. But now my mother's place in our home took on a new importance. 
I was struck by the beauty of her face. She wasn't a handsome woman, but now I could see the goodness written there. It was reflected in the little things she did. Making breakfast, talking to the old baker, Pop Adams, washing dishes, and loving all of us. Somehow I'd never felt the full force of her love before. I wish, uh, wish I could go over to her and tell her... No, Jerry. I wouldn't try to disturb her. Why don't you hop up here on the ironing board with me? No, no, I'm all right. It's just that there's so many things I wish I'd done to make her happier. Little kindnesses and remembrances. But I know she understands. It's her patience that makes her beautiful. Her gentle understanding, the sweetness in her voice. Billy, are you up? Alice, breakfast is getting cold. You'll be late for school if you don't hurry. Oh, Mother, I simply have to have a new dress. I don't have a decent thing to wear. Oh, what about the blouse and skirt you got last week? Doesn't it have that, that new something or other you've been talking about for a month? But after all, Mother, I can't wear that to school. It's too... too... Well, you understand, don't you, Mother? I'm a high school senior, and everybody expects us to look... Well, to look like... Yes, yes, I understand, but let's do a little thinking about it later. But, Mother, I need... Morning, Ma. Gee, I'll have to hurry. Billy, you're interrupting. Oh, guys, sis, can a fellow even say hello? Please don't begin the day arguing. Good morning, son. I'm not arguing. I just told Billy not to interrupt. That will be all now, Alice. Billy, did you say grace? Yes, Mom. Quick to myself, like. Well, what about saying it slow for yourself and the Lord? Yes, Mom. Bless me, Lord, and all these gifts which we have. And thank you, too. Well, that's mixed up, Billy, but <laughs> you look like a little angel when you act that way. Oh, Mom, I don't want to be an angel. I want to be a flyer like Jerry. When Jerry was your age, he didn't want to be a flyer. I bet he didn't want to be an angel. No, I guess not. But Jerry's a good boy. Always dependable. Always, Mother? Well, nearly always. But Billy's a good boy, too, Mother. Hey, sis, you feeling sick or something? No, Billy. I think you're sweet. I'll bet you want me to do something for you. Well, I was wondering if you'd have time after your paper. I'll bet you have another sorority meeting. No, it's the debate club. I won't have time in my dresses at the cleaners, and you could... Okay, okay. I'll think it over. It was too bad that Billy couldn't see what the angel and I were watching. For there was a struggle of two thoughts going through his mind. And his plain face took on light lines, like the faint etchings that an artist makes when he begins to paint. Then suddenly the lines changed and a brightness lightened his face. He smiled as if there were a generous, warm feeling inside him. Okay, sis. I think I'll be able to manage it now. Oh, thanks, Billy. See, Mother, didn't I tell you he's a darling? Yes, yes, I see. But what about you? Oh, Mom, I know she wants to go to the school dance tonight. <laughs> well, you're very kind to help her, son. No, no, I figured it out. You see, Jerry's away most of the time, and then he'll be getting married to Margie, and I'm the only man in the house. Well, so it's just one of those things. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess I better get going. Bye, Billy, and thanks. <laughs> Bye, Mom. Bye, Alice. Goodbye, son. Jerry, you see how much fun it is being an angel? Yeah, I guess when I was alive, I just didn't see things the way they really are. Well, perhaps it's not so easy. Oh, I don't know. It looks very easy now. That's because you're just standing by and watching. Maybe. But it seems wonderful to have Billy's chance to be kind and generous and make people happy. Can you see now how people grow more beautiful? Mm. You know, it seems so simple. I don't know why I never thought of it when I was alive. Jerry, hmm? it's time for us to be going. Yeah, I guess it is. I didn't know where we were going, yet leaving wasn't like saying goodbye, because I had a realization that we'd be separated for only a short time. True, I had a feeling of regret for what I might have done but hadn't, and yet I felt happy remembering the little that I had accomplished. If only Margie would understand. If only... You're thinking she won't understand. Yeah. You'd like to go down to Grand Central Station and see Margie. Oh, you know where she works? Yes. And that you used to ride into the city with her some mornings. 
and you'd see her to ticket window four, where she is right now. Well, say, you know a lot about Margie. Yes, indeed, quite a lot. Oh. You seem to forget I've been around with you on 24-hour duty. Well, uh, then you know how much I really love her. Yes. And it's true love, Jerry, because you respect her. You know, it's very strange. I, I, I should be sad because we were going to be married next month. And yet... And yet, now you're happy. But that's only because you know your love for her is unchanged, but different. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's why I'm so happy now. Well, here we are. Oh, this is quite a busy place. Everyone's in a hurry. Yeah, what you read? What you read? Get your afternoon paper in first edition. Please, Lord, let me sew them fast this afternoon. I want to go home and see if Ma's feeling better. Did you hear what he said? Yes, Jerry, little prayer. Well, I never knew people prayed like that. Well, you did it yourself sometimes, Jerry. I did. Sure. Nearly everybody does it at times. Hmm. Just listen over there. Oh, you mean the red cat? Yes. Lord, what I'm getting at is, is this, Lord. Uh, Lord, I don't know what people put in their bags that make them so heavy. Uh, and I ain't going to say anything to anybody about it but you, Lord. But, uh, Lord, uh, please give me a little patience with this lady who got me toting these things back and forth on account of she can't make up her mind where she's going. And, Lord, uh, I hope you don't mind if I ask you to send her a little inspiration about a good tip. Because I've been wasting a powerful lot of time with that lady, uh, what I'm getting at is, you know, and I'm just a poor working man with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a practical prayer. Yes, but sincerity is what counts most with God. Well, I can see now what Mother meant when she wouldn't come into the city. It must be confusing with everyone rushing and racing around you. Well, I guess I was just as bad as anyone. It all seems so unnecessary now. Oh, some of it's necessary. You see that couple over there? Rushing to the train gate? Yes. They were just married. Van Dolan, hurry, we'll miss the train. Yes, Joe, I'm coming. Dear God, help us make this a real marriage. Bless us and help us. She's praying, too. Certainly, Jerry. A great many people often say quiet little prayers like that all day long. Well, when I was alive, I never heard anyone talk about it. Mm, maybe not. But that's a part of all the wonderful goodness in the world. Uh, then that explains a lot of the kindness that I never understood. I don't know why we delayed, but instead of going over to Margie at the window, the angel walked through the crowds around the station. Without question, I followed obediently behind her. It was interesting to watch the reactions of different people to the little things around them, but uh, I was getting impatient. Don't be impatient, Jerry. Well, I don't see much purpose in wandering around here when we came down to see Margie. Oh, but there is. You'll find out. Besides, doesn't this chance to see people help you? Help me? How? To see the life you led in a new way. Oh, is, uh, is this a kind of judgment of myself? Yes, you can call it that. Oh, yeah, I understand. Then we're ready to see Margie. came into the ticket booth where she was working. The angel and I perched on the ledger in which she kept accounts. We watched her selling tickets and making change. Now I knew with a wonderful certainty why I loved her. There was a charm in her whole manner, a goodness and beauty in her face. She is beautiful, Jerry. Well, I wish she could have heard that. It's a real compliment. She deserves it. But, you know, she wasn't always as nice as that. Well, well, I always thought that... I had trouble with you, too, Jerry. Until you met her, mm. you improved together. Now, she really helped me a lot, didn't she? Yes. You needed her encouragement. Thanks, Margie. I didn't realize how much being in love with you meant to me. I only wish I could tell you. I think she must have heard in some way what I was trying to say because she smiled and brushed back her hair. For a moment, she seemed completely happy as she counted out the change. Eighty, ninety, one dollar. Yes, sir, you'll have ten minutes before the gates open. White Plains. One way. Round trip. What do you think I'm trying to do, get lost? <laughs> That'll be a dollar thirty-two. 
35, 45, 50, two dollars, thank you. Don't thank me, lady. I'm only going because I have to. Next. Poughkeepsie, one way, please. Two fifteen. Oh, did they raise the prices? Why, the last time I went to Poughkeepsie. Oh, I... please, madam, there are a number of people waiting. Two fifteen includes the federal tax. Oh, oh, Mr. Johnson, I'm so glad you came early. I have a special date tonight. I'll leave everything to you. Hmm? I want to run. Oh, oh, this lady's going to Poughkeepsie. Hey, Angel, you know something? What, Jerry? I never realized before why Margie used to be tired. Some evenings when she'd want to stay home and I felt like going out, I'd get annoyed at her. Now I know what Mother meant when she said I needed patience and understanding if we were going to be happy together. But I love her. I love her even more now. I didn't think it'd be like this, that I'd go on loving her after I was dead. Jerry? You'll be in love with her all eternity. I'm glad of that. That's the way I want it. You know, uh, I was afraid that after I was dead, I'd... You'd be uh... a ghost and haunt a house? <laughs> yeah, something like that. I never thought it would be as real as this. It's more real now than when you were alive. Everything seems easy to understand now. If only... You want to know what will happen when they get word about you at home. Yeah, I'd like to be there. Maybe I could... I, I know you'd like to help. Well, isn't there anything we could do? If I could only talk to them, say how happy I am. Oh, I don't think so. But we'll be there when Margie gets home. And we were. When we walked up the path to our house, Mother was sitting on the front porch. She was rocking slowly in the old chair that was always hers. She had the open telegram lying in her lap. There were tears on her cheek that she dried quietly with the edge of her apron. Alice was sitting near her. Beside her, Billy was kneeling, holding her hand. Mother, you remember when Dad died two years ago? You remember what Jerry said? What was that, son? He said he'd be the man of the house and that he'd take care of you. Yes. Yes, I, I remember, and he did. He took care of all of us. Well... That's what I wanted to say, Mom. Because now, I'll take care of you. You know that. Yes, son. I know you will. Well, Mom, you said God wanted it to be this way. And he has his own wise plans. Yes. Yes, I know it. It's only that and I... Mother, I'll take care of you, too. I'll see that, Mom, there's Margie. Oh, Oh, Billy, don't say anything to her at first. I'll go down and meet her. Hello, Margie. Hello, Billy. Why so solemn and serious? You look like you had all the troubles of the world on your shoulders. <laughs> you know, every day you're getting to look more like Jerry. And that's a big compliment. Thank you, Margie. Did Jerry get home yet? No, no. But Mom is sitting out on the porch... Do you want to go up and sit with her for a while? Mm-hmm. And you can keep me company, solemn face. And that was the moment when the angel got the idea of breaking into this program. So we made it into the studio here and sat up on the microphone. But I guess no one around knows anything about it because the music continues undisturbed. But it was the angel's idea of telling Margie and Mom and Alice and Billy just what happened. And I guess anyone else who was tuned in could hear it too. No, not any, everyone, Jerry. Only those who would be made happy by listening. And will Margie be happy? Yes, very happy. I won't lose her? No, Jerry, you won't lose her. And when... when will she... Die? It's not my department, Jerry. But when her time does come, it will be a gentle death. Margie, when it comes, don't be afraid. It's not hard to die, really. And I'll be waiting for you. I'll be waiting till you come. Jerry, it's time to go now. All right. Good night, Mother and Margie and Alice and Billy. You have 
you've been listening to a special half hour of soothing music. We hope you've been able to dream with us, to dream your own thoughts into a world of new hope. This program came to you through the courtesy of Jerry's Angel. Here again is your host, James A. Farley. Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin who said, a man cannot do a single good deed because every good deed we do is passed on from one person to another and continues to multiply itself among many people. All of us can look back in our lives and remember someone who helped us in difficulties. And it meant a renewal of our faith and hope and a promise that when we've had an opportunity, We'd be generous and unselfish in helping others. Yes, we have the opportunity to help those in need. And among the greatest need in the world today is a renewal of charity and brotherhood and faith in God, a renewal of the practice of family prayer. With God, all things are possible. With God's help, our lives, our homes, our families, and the world can be kept in peace and happiness. But we must ask for that help. We must pray sincerely, humbly, not only by ourselves, but as a family. A prayerful home is a happy home, and a prayerful world is a peaceful world. Because nations that pray together for peace will live together in peace, just as the family that prays together stays together. God bless you all, and good night. Our grateful thanks to Joan Caulfield, Richard Whitmark, and James A. Farley for their appearances, and to James B. Reuter and Mark Carney for writing our play. Original music was scored and conducted by Max Tear. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Brief portions were transcribed. The supporting cast included Sarah Selby, Anne Tobin, Mala Powers, Ralph Moody, Michael Chapin, and Jimmy Scribner. Next week, our Family Theater play will be The Legacy, starring Rhonda Fleming. Your host will be Alan Mowbray. This series of the Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program and by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. Be with us next week at the same time when Rhonda Fleming and Alan Mowbray will star on Family Theater. Your announcer, Merrill Ross. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.